Hello, everybody. Unfortunately, I will not be with you at the time of this showing because I will visit my sister in the Irish wilderness and will not be available. Let me share my screen and show you where I'm going to be. Just a second. This is the house of my sister. So you see, it's not surprising that we will have kind of unstable internet connection. I will, however, try to join you guys in the afternoon for the discussion session with my unfortunately somewhat unstable uh, internet connection. But now let's come to the talk. I want to talk about a new test of the cosmological principle. I want to show you that it is possible to measure both the kinetic Doppler term, the kinetic dipole, and the dipole due to anisotropies independently. This is an idea which we have developed with our master's student, uh, Tobias Nadolny, with my colleagues, Martin Kuntz and Hamza Padmanabhan. Uh, after a brief introduction, I will talk about the weighted number counts, which are the idea how one could measure both independently, the kinematic and the intrinsic dipole. Then I will apply this idea to some synthetic forecasts for LSST Euclid and SKA, and finally give you my results and conclusions. As you all know, our uh, peculiar velocity with respect to the CMB has been measured very accurately, actually not only by the dipole, but also via the modulation of the dipole and its operation, which plays into which affects higher multiples of the CMB. Within standard cosmology, this should actually agree with the velocity of, with our velocity with respect to the large scale matter distribution, if we go to sufficiently large scales. People have tried to measure this velocity. This has a long history. I still remember the Lauer and Postman result with respect uh, of our velocity with respect to Abel clusters, which was much too large. Then during the last uh, couple of years, people have analyzed mainly radio surveys, NVSS and other surveys, and also found velocities which didn't agree with the CMB1. And most uh, recently, uh, the velocity with respect to a sample of quasars has been studied. And the latest measurements, which are also discussed during this workshop by Secres de Tal, find uh, nearly five sigma discrepancy with respect to the CMB velocity. Apart from that all these people have made mistakes, which is not impossible, there are two possible conclusions, as I can see it. One is that the rest frame with, uh, uh, of the CMB does not agree with the rest frame of matter, that there are two different rest frames in the universe. So our universe is not homogeneous and isotropic. And therefore, we would measure a different kinematic dipole. Another possibility, however, is also that the intrinsic dipole is larger than the predictions from lambda CDM, the intrinsic dipole from clustering, etc., or an anisotropy of space time. Mm -hmm. We expect that the angular distribution of sources around us on very large scales and integrated over a considerable redshift range should exhibit 
a dipole which is due to our motion that we call the kinematic dipole. But of course, also the clustering of sources will generically generate a dipole, a number count dipole. In addition, there might be maybe an intrinsic dipole of our geometry if we would live, for example, in a Bianchi model and not in a Freeman universe. We shall denote the combi combination of these last two, the geometric and the clustering dipole as the intrinsic dipole. The CMB dipole amplitude has been measured with high precision. It is, if it is attributed to our velocity, this leads to a velocity of 1.2 10 to the minus 3 in a very well measured direction. And it probably also contains a small portion of an intrinsic dipole, but we expect it to be two or three orders of magnitude smaller than the motion dipole. Let us now study the kinematic dipole from number counts. If we count sources, they are affected by our dipole, uh, by our motion with respect to their mean velocity on a background universe. On the one hand, the observed solid angle is modified simply by the Doppler effect, by a boost in some, uh, uh, if we look in some direction n, so the boost is in direction beta, and we look in direction n, then we see this kind of solid angle. Furthermore, the number density at the flux limit of our survey scales as some power x, and the flux behaves as some uh, power law nu to the minus alpha in the vicinity of the observed frequency range. If we consider that uh, the, the frequency shift we find, in addition to the solid angle dipole, which gives this factor two, a factor x times one plus alpha from the change of the flux. For typical radio galaxies, we have x of order unity and alpha roughly 0.75. So this gives a kinematic dipole if we assume that beta is the motion of, the C, the, uh, of us with respect to the CMB we get a kinematic dipole of 4.6 times 10 to the minus 3. This is a, a um, number to keep roughly in mind. So it's a few 10 to the minus 3, what we expect. Let us also calculate the intrinsic dipole from clustering using uh, perturbation theory, which should be fine on very large scales, so should be fine for the dipole if we have a minimal redshift of, let's say, 0.1 or so. Linear perturbation theory should be really fine. The intrinsic dipole from clustering in lambda CDM is actually quite large. This was, I must say, a surprise to me. Here, we show, I show you the intrinsic dipole, which you obtain just running the class linear perturbation theory calculation with the set mean, which is indicated here for the different line, and a set max on this axis. So you see, if you look at galaxies, count galaxies with redshifts between 0.1 and 0.2, you expect an intrinsic dipole, which is much larger than the CMB dipole. And this was calculated with a bias factor of 1.5. So if you would take Abel clusters, they have a much higher bias than 1.5, this would get even larger. Here, uh, we also show the, the effect of redshift space distortions. Without redshift space distortion, you get the dashed line, and with redshift space distortion, the solid line. So in this case, with a bias of 1.5, just assumed as an example, um, redshift space distortions cannot be neglected. They make about a quarter or so of the final result. Yeah, no, yeah, the third. Even. If you, however, would start your catalog at very high redshifts and go to very high redshifts, then you get a dipole of order 10 to the minus 3, which is a bit smaller than 
uh, the kinematical dipole. Nevertheless, as we know, at these high redshifts, usually the bias is not 1.5, but higher. So this is one of the things which I really want to stress here. Don't underestimate the intrinsic dipole which you expect in Lambda CDM. I was very surprised when I saw this result. Now, what you also have, of course, is shot noise, right? Since you, uh, if we do number counts, we count the finite number of uh, galaxies or sources, and this introduces shot noise, which is given by one over n, where n bar, where n bar is the density, the angular density of sources. So it's the total number which we can't divide it by four pi in a full sky, and otherwise we have to divide also by the sky fraction. The dipole for an arbitrary C1 is given by this expression. So in a, in, for, a, for a shock noise, it gives three over square root of n top for full sky coverage. For example, if n top is 10 to the 6, the shock noise is comparable to the kinematic dipole. I think this is also an important uh, small result to keep in mind. The total dipole for, from number counts now is the kinematical one, the intrinsic one, and the one from shock noise. They have to be added. And what we now introduce is we can write this number count with some arbitrary function of some source properties. Let's uh, name just the flux as a source property, the redshift or the angular size of our sources. And instead of just counting galaxies, we can weight them with some weighting function. Then the density, the distribution of these weights will be just the sum of over our sources of the weighting function times delta function at each position of a source. And we can look, well, we can look at the uh, total di weighted dipole, at the dipole of this weighted quantity, which is an angular dependent quantity. The kinematical dipole of this quantity will be some weight which depends on what we look at because we know how, for example, redshift or angular size or flux change with, uh, with a boost. This will give us a weight, Bw, with which the, the kinematic dipole scales. The, the Bn of the number count we have already investigated, it was 2 plus x times 1 plus alpha. So nearly 4. For another right, it might be something different. Wherever the intrinsic, where however, the intrinsic dipole of the number counts is what it is. We assume it to be independent of these intrinsic properties, which is to some extent uh, assumption. The short noise, however, we will see will be also different for the weighted dipole. So now if you have measured uh, dw top and dn top, you can just uh, take this difference and divide it by the difference of the weight, and that should, you, should give you the estimate of beta. Or, you can take, you can multiply uh, the number counts with the weight of the weighted ones and the, uh, the estimate, the weighted dipole with the weight of the number counts. And in this way, isolate the intrinsic dipole. Of course, they all are always still plagued by shock noise, so you need sufficiently many sources that shock noise is not limiting you too much. Let me now give you two examples. First, LSST and Euclid. We'll, we consider the photometric surveys and choose as our weight uh, the magnitude of the object to some power, which we will determine to optimize 
the result and the redshift to some other power. While for SKA, we shall uh, consider the flux to some power times the angular size to some other power. Here is shown the distribution for LSST in this case of redshifts and magnitudes for the red and the blue galaxy sample in LSST, just as an example. And correspondingly, for, uh, for SKA, we show the distribution of AGNs and star forming galaxies as a function of their angular size and their flux as they are expected. Now we cal can calculate the number count fluctuation with class. Use the bias, uh, we use the bias and the evolution bias and S of Z from the Al Alonso et al code, produce the Gaussian realization in the sky using the sky coverage of the experiment and full sky, both of it. Then we Poisson sample this distribution with the number density as a function of magnitude and redshift or as a function of flux and angular size using the distributions which I've shown you before and with, for a fixed total number. On this, we then apply a boost with the beta CMB on all the uh, properties and we calculate the signal to noise for beta for different writing exponents. When we analyze the resulting ma maps for the best weights, we calculate the dipole for the number count and for the weighted number counts. The prefactors Pn and Pw, in principle, we know them, but we can also determine them because they will be a weighted average of the, of the ones which go in for uh, the change of magnitude and redshift or flux and, and angular size, we can determine but just by just boosting a random sky distribution very significantly with a large velocity and by determining its dipole, which, which then will be purely the kinematic dipole. So one can even determine this uh, exp kind of experimentally with a numerical experiment. So what we have done, we have now calculated the signal to noise, which is the signal is beta divided by shot noise. And the shot noise is three over square root of n top over delta w. And delta w is the difference in these writing factors times the mean of the white divided by its variance, right? We, if we could have a white which, is, which has no variance, which is very, very um, unique, then we would have a very small spread of this white and we could determine our signal very well. However, if the, if the white is not very peak and is very widely spread out, then this delta W becomes smaller and the signal to noise come, becomes correspondingly smaller, even if we have a large enthalpy. So here for fixed enthalpy, we, we um, calculated this signal to noise as a function of the, uh, of the redshift exponent, of the magnitude exponent for LSST and Euclid. And we found the maximum somewhere here where the right is, uh, is nearly four. So this uh, delta W, right? We cannot change anything in n top. That's just our survey. Beta we assume to be given. So we want to maximize this delta W, which, uh, and so we, we chose these exponents to maximize delta W. So here. And here, depending on whether we want to look at these optical surveys, galaxy surveys, or at the radio surveys here. Then we looked the accuracy which we could gain on beta 
Now from LSST and Euclid, from just using the number count dipole and from choosing our weighted approach. Um, the solid line is the signal for uh, the value for beta, which we obtain. The dashed line is the error. And so you see, if you have the weighted approach, the error just goes like one over n taught, as we would expect it. Uh, uh, if the only noise which we have is short noise, and that's what we have here. However, if we only have the number count dipole, we will just kind of stop at the value of the intrinsic dipole. There's nothing that can be done about it. What is also interesting here is that you see that full sky is really an advantage with respect to cut sky. You know, for LSST and Euclid, the sky coverage is something like less than 40%. So it's, uh, that is a little bit the problem with them. This also hinders a lot the, a precise detection of the direction. If we would have full sky, we could determine the direction much better. But you see also that uh, the weighted approach is really much, much more favorable from the number count. But this actually only pays off if we have at least an end a total number of sources of 10 to the 7. If you have less than 10 to the 7 sources, it doesn't really matter because the shot noise is just too large. And so we can just stick with the number counts. Here we you see the same for SKA. Um, the difference between SKA and the full sky is less prominent because SKA has larger sky coverage. And uh, also the angular determination is better. But the, the important point is again that the error just goes down and down uh, in the weighted approach, whereas for if you just use a number count dipole, we are limited by the value of the intrinsic dipole. We can also, in principle, measure the intrinsic dipole via the second lighting scheme, which I showed you. Here, the dashed line, black, is always full sky. And in the dotted lines in color, we show not only the the, the intrinsic dipole, but also the leakage which one has if one has incomplete sky coverage from higher multiples. This can in principle be uh, subtracted because the map is known, but here we don't subtract it. And here you see also the intrinsic dipole for LSST Euclid photometric survey is about one times 10 to minus three. Uh, sorry. Yes, while um, for SKA it is smaller because you are at higher redshifts. It is somewhat smaller. And the leakage for LSST and Euclid is, of course, more substantial than for SKA, which also hinders precise determination of the direction. What we analyzed a little bit also was measurement errors. There are several possible measurement errors which enter here. For example, uh, we, if we assume a measurement error sigma z in the redshift for LSST or Euclid, we find that this translates into an error in beta and actually it can give uh, systematic change in beta if the measurement error is too large. If it is 10 to the minus 1, you see we get a systematic change. But the moment it becomes of order 10 to minus 2 or smaller, we get the same result as if we have no error. So the error sigma, if sigma c would be 10 to the minus 2 um, 
or smaller, the the error would be negligible. However, we know for the Euclid photometric survey, the error is more like five times ten to the minus three. So this will give a systematic, uh, a systematic error of about ten percent in the result. Similarly, we looked what if we have an error in the measurement of the size of radio galaxies with SKA. And this error between 1 and 0.1 arc second, we see if it is less than a few 0.3 or 0.4 arc seconds, uh, we, we do not get a shift. However, if it is like 1 arc second, we get a systematic shift in beta of again about 10%. But the other bars are, of course, considerably large as well. The final result, we tend to the nine sources, which we get uh, and, uh, uh, for LSST and Euclid. And with uh, sigma Z and sigma uh, of, of 5%, so 0 0.05, which I think is realistic, we start at Z min of 0.2 and have a sky coverage of about 40%. We can measure beta with an error of 1.4%, the direction to about one degree, and the intrinsic dipole to about four or five percent, and its direction to about three degrees. For SKA. Uh, we will not have 10 to the 9 sources, but maybe 10 to the 8. And if we assume an error of, uh, of 0.1 arc second and the minimum size of 0.3 arc second and 61% sky coverage, these are the error bars which we will get in a realistic SKA survey. The error bars are larger than for Euclid and SKA, mainly because we have less sources. You can see here a factor of 10 less sources gives a factor of nearly three in the error. That's just the way it goes. The intrinsic dipole error is very large and the intrinsic dipole therefore probably cannot be measured because it is small in the SKA. So this is not, of course, cannot be just a factor of three, because here we have a larger intrinsic dipole, which we can measure. So whereas here it is smaller. That's more or less all I wanted to tell you. So my main point is, Uh, the intrinsic dipole from large-scale uh, clustering is typically 10 to the minus 3 and not 10 to the minus four, uh, 5. Even for a survey uh, from redshift 1 to 4 as SKA. By combining two or maybe even more observables, it is possible to isolate both the kinematic and the intrinsic dipole. If one would add a third uh, observable, one could even, uh, I think, reduce the errors. To extract the intrinsic dipole, a good sky coverage is very important. A large end top of order 10 to the 8 sources is required for a measurement with 10% accuracy. Otherwise, we just have a shot noise, which is comparable, actually, with the signal itself. With LSST and Euclid, we'll be able, we will be able to measure both the kinematic and the intrinsic dipole, including its leakage from uh, the ma mask, to a few percent accuracy in amplitude and a few degrees in direction. So we will really be able to distinguish the two and see whether what has been seen in the uh, in the quasars is an intrinsic dipole or is a kinematic dipole or what kind of mixture of the two. 
for SKA, the kinematic dipole can be measured with, with similar accuracy, but the intrinsic dipole will be less well measured because it is about the factor of two smaller. I think it might be interesting to apply this lighting technique also to higher multiples of the number counts and to see what we can measure and what we can learn about the geometry and the matter distribution of our universe from that. This is all I wanted to tell you, so I'm open for questions and um, I hope uh, I will see you during the discussion time and you have questions for me. Looking forward to meet you all. I can tell you that during next week, I will not be really present, but I will look your talks and hopefully come up with some questions and be there for some of the discussion sessions. See you later. Bye.